That song was at number one in August 1967, and Procol Harum also were booked to play a gig organized by Radio Carolina, the ballroom in Kent, the Bell Temple Ballroom. This was in the week leading up to August the 14th, when the Marine Offences Bill became the Marine Offences Act, and it became illegal for any British subject to be anyway involved with a fire radio station. I was lucky enough uh, to be on shore in the week leading up to the 14th and went to the Bell Tavern along with fellow DJ Robbie Dale. Uh, Ronan O'Reilly had uh, arranged for the whole of the ballroom to be completely decked out in flowers. Uh, it was the most incredible sight and there was a queue about a mile long of Caroline fans outside who wanted to just come uh, and wish good luck to Caroline as it headed up to this dramatic day on the 14th of August when it was going to defy the British government. Radio London had said that it would carry on and fight against it. But uh, with only about uh, three weeks to go to the, to the date, Radio London uh, decided that they were not going to carry on. And the only radio station that was prepared to defy this new law and carry on broadcasting was the original Radio Caroline. Well, Robbie Dale and I uh, journeyed from London on an amazing day when thousands of fans invaded Liverpool Street Station in London, uh, just muscled their way onto the train that took us out to the East Coast to catch the boat at Carroll. Again, there were hundreds of people on the quayside there who wanted to wish us luck. And we set up on the tumble to Radio Caroline to find when we arrived at the ship, all the rest of the DJs, they'd not had that week on shore and all the support they'd had tried out on the North Sea on their own when they just what had happened if they defied the law. And they all had decided that they were going to leave the radio station. They all had their bags packed, uh, all ready to go, and nothing that Robbie or I said to them could persuade them to do any different. The problem was that by breaking the law, they would not be able to come back into England again. So it was a decision, a big one, to decide to go into exile and maybe not enter the UK again for a, a period of time up to two years. So anyway, they got on the tender and they went back. And again, uh, there were hundreds of fans who were waiting to welcome back the DJs from Radio London. And the man who presented the last program on Radio London one afternoon with their newsreader, Paul Kay. One mention has been made of the fact that mine was the first voice to be heard on Radio London. It will also be the last in regrettably few minutes from now. But before that, please allow me to introduce the managing director of Radio London, Mr. Philip Birch. It was just three years ago this month that the idea for Radio London was born. I did my, uh, four months prior to the the closed down. I, uh, I recorded it about a day before. And, um, no, I wasn't on the ship. I wasn't in the office. I felt so bad. I got in my car and drove and sat and listened to my, uh, the closed down on my car with my, uh, parked and laid by, uh, and cried. As well as to put it, the world will get by without the girl. But I'm not sure that it will be a better place. The girl time is three o'clock on Radio London. is now closing down. <laughs>
They played that theme tune. And that silence. You could tell the transmitter was to come on, and then after about 30 seconds, that turned off. And then you just heard the noise of a radio band with nothing on it. I was on the hotel line at the time. Robbie Dale was listening in to the close down of Radio London. He came straight into the Caroline studio. He was crying as well. You've got to try and understand. These radio stations and the people who worked on them became families to the listeners. And people got enormous pressure out of those radio stations. When the government just passed that law and said they're going to go off the air, nobody really believed it would happen. When Radio London played their signature tune for the last time, and then there was dead silence, people realized it had happened. And Robbie Dale said an emotional farewell to Radio London and its listeners, and he welcomed them to Radio Caroline. Many of them, of course, tuned over from 266 to 259. Radio Caroline was now on its own. Robbie Dale and I carried on doing radio programs. He went home on the air at 6 o'clock. I took over at 9 o'clock for my regular 9 to midnight show. Robbie then rejoined me in the studio at about a quarter to 12. And I saw seconds ticked away to midnight on August the 14th, 1967. I pulled out my bit of paper that Roman had written a few words for me to say and made this announcement to an estimated European audience of 22 million radio listeners. This is Radio Caroline. It is now 12 midnight. <laughs> history, you naturally have our assurance that we intend to stay on the air because we belong to you and we love you. Caroline continues. I get the most amazing tingles up my spine when I hear that. And a few days before August the 14th, I'm chatting with Ronan, and he said, listen, this is what to say. The fact that they've had to come in with a new law to make it illegal for British subjects means that this station in international waters is legal. Hence, we thanked Harold Wilson and the British government for recognizing our right to be there. And I said, what about the first record after midnight, Ronan? And he said, hey, baby, it's simple. It's the Beatles, isn't it? They started Easter Sunday with Can't Buy Me Love. Uh, midnight, August the 14th, the first record, this one. Nothing you can sing that can't be sung. Nothing you can say that you can learn how to play the game.
most amazing things started to happen. We went to bed that night thinking as we were woke, the British Navy would be on our side, Caroline. We'll all be arrested and hauled off to jail. It didn't happen. But what did turn up at the side of the Mir Miko about 10 o'clock on August the 15th was the smallest inflatable boat you've ever seen. And the fellow on board had this minuscule outboard motor on the back and he said, uh, do you need anything, lad?